be authentically yourself don't try and be like anyone else like don't be like oh my favorite youtuber does this so i'm gonna do that too like find what makes you really unique find your niche and um and really try and use that as much as you can and enjoy what you're doing because people can tell online when it's authentic and when it's not Hello, I am Sophie Lloyd, and this is On The Record with Ultimate Guitar. So are you familiar with Ultimate Guitar? Are you a Tab user? Oh yeah, I think every I think every guitarist on the planet is familiar with Ultimate Guitar, whether they admit it or not. I'm definitely, like, growing up, I was definitely a Tab user, and then I tried to go a little bit more into learning by ear, but it's still always there as my as my backup. Well, that's great to hear. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're part of our community, so welcome. Um, so did you move on to learning music theory afterwards and did you find that transition to be difficult or was it an easy transition for you? Yeah, so I never really studied music like in school or anything. So it was definitely a new, th like, I studied it at university. That was the first time I started studying it. So, um, but I, I've always quite enjoyed music theory. Like I'm a little bit of a nerd in that sense. So um, I, I enjoyed when I started to actually understand what I was playing and be able to, it sort of made me a lot better player when I understood the kind of theory behind scales and stuff. It really opened up a lot of doorways for me. So for those of us that grew up on tabs, is there maybe a good doorway into the world of music theory? Was there a concept that you found easier to access than others? I think we started just from right from the basics, just learning, you know, the notes where they are, where they live on the guitar. So usually most people know like just the low E string and that's kind of it on the E and the A, but kind of learning where they live all over the guitar was really, really beneficial to me. And um, then just kind of learning how different scales, you know, interact with each other and learning how they relate to each other. So a lot of people will know the major scale really well, or a lot of people will know the minor pentatonic scale really well. And um, just relating all the complicated stuff you learn, I kind of just relate it all back to either the major scale or the minor pentatonic and it's all kind of this the same shit like you can all kind of combine it into into one thing if you think about how it relates back to something you already know really well so when you're writing music um is that something that's in the forefront front of your mind when you're composing uh new material or is it or do you kind of just go by feel i think it depends sort of what i'm writing i definitely try to think about it a little bit <laughs> and I think at one point I thought about it too much where it was just keeping me in this box and I wasn't really exploring outside of it. I'd be like, well, I can't play that. No, that's not in this scale. So I definitely had to kind of train myself to learn how to like bend and break the rules of, of music theory. And that's kind of where the fun of music comes in. So although I do think about it, I don't let it kind of control my playing completely. I did get a chance to listen to the new record, which comes out in like a week or two. It's coming up. Yeah, 10th of November. What a wonderful record. For a guitar fan, it's a must listen. Thank you so much. That means a lot. <laughs> so when did this process start? It was, a, as I understand it, a very collaborative record. Um, I know sometimes those can take a while uh, with logistics to kind of put those together. But when did you start working on it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's been crazy. We started like pretty much the beginning of the pandemic. So it's been in the works for like three, maybe nearly four years, like a crazy amount of time. Um, we started writing and then we actually went into the studio. Uh, we were in the studio, I think, in 2020. Uh, so three years ago was when we hit the studio and actually recorded all of like the main instrumental parts. And from then it was sort of, um, you know, reaching out to vocalists. We wanted to have like a good, really great sounding kind of backing track, quote unquote, to send them so that they could really hear, you know, the potential in it and everything then they would sort of send it back and it would be, a, it's kind of like, I didn't realize how complicated the process is. Cause I guess this is my first album and for it to be a collab album is kind of crazy. Cause it's just, you know, you have to work with so many different people, different deadlines, different labels, managers, everything like that to sort of get it to all come, come to a head at the same time. And then just as we were sort of getting ready to release it, then all the MGK stuff happened. So we had to push it back a little bit further. So it's been a lot of like, um, kind of, setbacks and stuff in that sense so I'm so excited that I can finally say it's like coming out soon because I just want I just want people to hear it <laughs> I think people are going to be really stoked about it is there a riff or a solo or a song that you're most proud of or that you're most excited for people? I think on, on like all of them are so mean so much to me in different ways um this was always like an album I said 
that I wrote for my like 15 year old self. So it's quite like a retrospective album. And it's one I kind of wrote for that girl who, you know, was a bit of an outcast and stuff. She just knew she loved music and she loved all of these artists. And I had so many posters on my wall of people that are on this album, like Lizzie Hale. I was the biggest Hailstorm fan. Me and my mum would like sing Hailstorm in the car on the way to school. And, you know, Chris Robertson from Blackstone Cherry, Michael Starr, all of these people were like, I had their albums on my walls. So every, you know, hearing their voices that were like the voices of my childhood kind of on the tracks that they're on has just been such like a surreal experience. And I'd say, you know, especially the the Lizzie Hale, like imposter syndrome, like the title album, that song, like the lyrics of that song mean a lot to me. Me and Lizzie got together and we had like this really like kind of deep, really he healing, actually, this really healing chat for me. Um, that kind of validated, you know, my feelings about everything. And it was just really cool to have like one of your heroes kind of talk to you about that. And then she wrote that beautiful song, which kind of put everything I thought into words. So that song is very special to my heart. Was that a pretty common theme throughout the record as far as the writing of the lyrics? Was that a collaborative process or did you kind of put that in the hands of some of the singers? It kind of was a song by song basis. Um, Generally, we'd sort of, like I said, we'd created sort of this, you know, glorified backing track <laughs> with a guitar solo. And then um, I sent them that and I wanted to give them as much freedom as they wanted to have, if you know what I mean. So I was like, you can write whatever you want on this. This is what the album is about. Uh, this is my kind of thoughts and feelings. This is what the album's going to be called. This is, you know, and I explained to them a little bit about that. And um, yeah, I pretty much gave them freedom. They, then they'd send like a demo back to me if I wanted any changes or anything. Then um, I'd let them know and then they'd record the final version and send it over to me. So it was kind of, it was, it was a collaborative process, but I definitely tried to give them yeah, as much freedom as they would like to have with it. As far as the writing on this song, was there, was there any particular song that pushed you out of your comfort zone or pushed you in like a technical aspect as far as the guitar playing on this record? There was definitely like some of the guitar solos, which really kind of, I tried to use, like be a bit more creative and use some like different scales that I didn't usually use, like Judge and Jury with Tyler Connolly. That solo um, has a lot of like diminished stuff in it. It's kind of Avenged Sevenfoldy. And that was something that I hadn't, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a pentatonic girl kind of growing up. So that was something that sort of made me uh, think outside the box in that sense and using notes that, that I was saying like weren't from the scale where I had to break the rules a little bit. And um, same with uh, Avalanche um, with Trevor McNeven. That was one where the solo, the, the solo on that song is pretty long. And that was so, so challenging for me to get like, because uh, a lot of the, a lot of the solos I actually wrote, I find I work quite well under pressure. So a lot of the solos I actually wrote like the night before we were like recording in the studio. And those were like some of them where I, I would just stay up all night and kind of write the solo. And I feel like sometimes that's just how I work best with that pressure deadline. So uh yeah, that was fun. A lot of times I'll write things that I can't play and then I'm like, now i got to learn how to play this and play it well and consistently. <laughs> so that was, yeah, those solos were definitely a challenge. Have there been conversations yet about how do you play these songs in a live setting? Are you going to go on tour, a solo tour at some point? Yeah, we'd love to. Like we haven't booked one in yet because we're not sure what next year looks like with uh, all the other commitments, but we definitely want to be touring this we're sort of exploring what that looks like now we're not sure whether to you know do a similar thing to like what Nita's has done what a lot of people have done which is getting a vocalist that can sing all of the songs and maybe having guests come out like if we're in their city a guest will come out or whether to maybe do something that's a little bit more kind of futuristic in a sense where I love the way like um if you know Lindsay Sterling she's like a violinist and she does these incredible tours which are she'll have like crazy costume changes, dances, kind of like Cirque du Soleil meets, you know, a musician, like a, vi a violinist. And I think that's that element is really cool of like bringing in this kind of like show aspect to it somehow, whether it's through, you know, like big screens at the back and having like the artist sing on a gr over a green screen and then like they're like there. But obviously that's a lot higher budget, so that maybe won't be the first tour, but <laughs> this is me just <laughs> dreaming big. But um, yeah, we're not sure. We'd love to tour. Also, like maybe do some clinics around the country as well, where it's a bit of a QA and a and then we play a few songs too. So there's a lot of different options. We're kind of exploring which one is the best. So when you started writing uh, for this record during the pandemic, I would imagine there was like a wish list of singers that you wanted to work with. Did you get all those? Are there some singers that you'd like to work with, maybe on volume two or the next record that's coming out? I know it's way too early to talk about that. Yeah, definitely. Like this was, I definitely had a wish list and 
all of these people that were on on the album were on that wish list and like everyone is incredible everyone's someone I'm such a big fan and, I, uh, and I've loved their voice for so for so so long uh wish list I also would have loved to have maybe in the future or something to work with Ollie Sykes he's uh an incredible vocalist someone I love also I'd like to work with like a few more people that push me out of my comfort zone a little bit whether it's like maybe a rapper I think would be quite cool to sort of explore that combination of music of like the shred guitar and the kind of rap and a lot of bands are kind of doing that we do that a little bit in some of the MGK live shows a lot of his rap songs we kind of turn into metal songs uh, which is really interesting and I love the idea of doing something like that in the future so you know like I said this album is quite retrospective for the next one I'd like to be a bit more forward thinking of it and work with people that you wouldn't expect. And sonically what what were you using for gear on this record I would imagine your signature guitar with I, I love that guitar by the way um yeah oh thank you <laughs> it's so pretty <laughs> yes yeah, so we were using so yeah i used the signature keys or guitar for all of the solos for a lot of the rhythm stuff we also actually used an esp just because it had an evertune so uh it saved a lot of time with tuning and stuff so that was that was quite helpful we have a whole like behind the scenes kind of um playlist over on my youtube which you can scan a qr code in the physical album and you can see everything we used and stuff and then we used a EVH 5150 for the majority of, of stuff, often double tracking or even quadruple tracking and then running in parallel with uh, a Marshall JCM 800. Um, for a lot of the solo stuff, we also used my diesel VH4, which I absolutely love the sound of. Um, and that was that was mostly it. Like in terms of pedals and stuff, most of it was done uh, via like software and stuff by by our producer. But um, yeah, those were the amps we used running through a Mesa Boogie cap as well. Are you a fan of using modelers at all? Um, not just in the live setting, but in the studio? What do you get out of those two amps that you don't necessarily get out of a modeler? I'd say, well, I use modelers a lot with like my YouTube stuff. So we use like neural DSP all the time. Like archetype knowledge is what, like what I would class as like my sound, if you know what I mean. Um, and then on stage, I use a Kemper a lot of the time, um, or I use the quad cortex. So I'm a big fan of modelers. I think they sound they sound great. They're so convenient. I'm very weak. I have little arms, so I can't carry a big amp around. So it's helpful for me. Uh, but I do think when you're recording, there's just something special when you're recording an album to get that like kind of proper amp feel to it and that big sound. It's just kind of that natural raw thing to it. I don't know what it is, whether it's like a little bit of the hiss of the amp. I'm not sure what it is. There's just something that just feels a bit more magical i guess <laughs> when you're using you know actual amps in the studio and you mentioned your youtube channel which of course we'll link to uh and there's always exciting stuff coming out the enter sandman song sounded great awesome video oh uh, thank you <laughs> do you have some tips to uh guitar players that are trying to make a dent in that youtube world it's difficult at the moment because it's like easier than ever but it's also harder than ever because there's so much opportunity for you to post like on TikTok, so many more people are going viral, but also it's so oversaturated now that it's difficult to make a dent. I'd say things which are important is try and find, firstly, be authentically yourself. Don't try and be like anyone else. Like don't be like, oh, my favorite YouTuber does this, so I'm gonna do that too. Like find what makes you really unique, find your niche and, um, and really try and use that as much as you can and enjoy what you're doing. Because people can tell online when it's authentic and when it's not and that's something really really important um with online content is being yourself uh the next thing is just post consistently as much as you can um especially if you're doing short form stuff like tiktok instagram and all of that and also like rinse what you've got if you do one like long uh horizontal video then and it's maybe like two minutes long then cut that into like five or six 15 second vertical videos and use that on TikTok and Instagram. Like you can reuse content in that way and like cross post to different accounts and stuff and just kind of just, yeah, post as much as you can. You've got to work hard. You've got to try and come up with something new and creative that's authentic to yourself. Well, we appreciate all the work that you put in. I know it's not as easy as people think it is and uh, and you put a lot of work in and it's, it's how many viewers do you have now? Uh, well, I've just hit, uh, just over a million on YouTube, which I'm so, so excited about. Uh, I'm very, we still have our balloon <laughs> from, the, from the million party, the cat's destroyed to the M, but we've still got the one. Uh, and um, I, I'm almost at a million on Instagram as well. TikTok, I don't know, I don't check TikTok. I'm not very good at that. <laughs> Probably most of them are just my mum rewatching the videos again and again. <laughs> it's 
through the process of making a record, I know that's a, a big learning process. So what's the difference between Sophie today and Sophie from before you started writing that first record? I think, well, this whole record has this overarching theme of, you know, imposter syndrome. And basically when I started writing this record, I was this, you know, girl who was scared to play live at all. I'd grown up on the internet. Everything was always behind a screen where you can edit, where you can, you know, t do as many takes as you want. Like I'd never kind of really put myself out there in a sense. And starting writing this album throughout the process was me thinking like, I want to try and overcome this. Like this album is gonna, sort of going to be telling the story of me overcoming this. And like, I've gone from that, you know, when I first started writing that album to now where I've played on some of like the biggest stages, like I played in stadiums and stuff. And that whole process there of just me kind of the confidence, I guess, growing of knowing I can play in front of <laughs> so many people as well as behind a screen has just been really cool. So this whole album has just been so healing for me. And I've, you know, it's just changed my mindset a lot of um, of music and to actually have fun with it rather than be so overly concerned about playing exactly what you've written, playing exactly the right notes. Just go out, have fun, put on a show and, you know, learn to laugh at yourself, learn to have fun and accept the mistakes and they help you grow. So I think it's just been a mindset shift over everything. And you've been so gracious with your time and I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say to the Ultimate Guitar community? Uh, thank you so much for having me. I love Ultimate Guitar. You guys are incredible and you guys have an amazing community and I'm honored to be a part of it. But yeah, get our new album, Imposter Syndrome. This is the vinyl. Comes out 10th of November and I hope you guys love it. I hope you guys can relate to some of the lyrics and stuff. I hope you like the solos. Hopefully the tabs will be on Ultimate Guitar as well, so maybe you can learn it. And <laughs> thank you guys so, so much for having me. It's been so great to chat to you.